Hello and good morning to you. We are thankful for you and we're blessed to worship God and to do so together. So we thank you for your presence here today. We're going to be in Revelation. We'll be in chapter 4 in just a moment. If you'd like to turn to that book, it's the last book of the, the Bible, the last book of the New Testament. We'll be in chapter 4 momentarily. Put on the screen here, A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3, 4. Quickly, can you tell me, or at least say in your mind, the next four letters in sequence? Now tell me the next three numbers in sequence. Now that you've got those, tell me the next three letters in sequence, and the next four numbers in sequence here. All that to show us just a little bit of how easily we can get confused going back and forth between different tasks and different ways of thinking. The more and more we are relying on digital technology, the more we think we can multitask. But the word multitasking is actually just a myth. Dr. Clifford Nass, a Stanford researcher, professor, says this about the idea of multitasking. The research is almost unanimous, which is very rare in social science, and it says that people who chronically multitask show an enormous range of deficits. They're basically terrible at all sorts of cognitive tasks, get this, including multitasking. So in our research, the people who say they're best at multitasking, they say that because they do it all the time. So think about what he says in that middle sentence. They're terrible at all sorts of cognitive tasks, including multitasking. What he's saying is if we set up a study where you've got a, a big group of people who say, I multitask all the time and I'm good at it. Then you take another group of people that say, I focus on one thing at a time and I devote a chunk of time to this task and once it's finished, I move on. Maybe I take a short break, I move on to another task. If you take those two groups of people and you give them the same multitasking problem, the group that focuses will accomplish that more effectively than the group that's comfortable or more prone to multitasking. Think about that for just a moment. How big of a temptation it is for us to think we can do a lot of things or multiple things at once. Now think about how that impacts something like what we're doing this very morning, which is to focus, to focus on worshiping God. As we consider a good work, the good works of a healthy church, we must always remember that it's focused worship that connects us to God. We must resist this urge in this era to think that we can do a lot of different things at once and especially resist that urge when it comes to giving worship, glory, and praise to God in heaven. What does only mean? How, how early did you learn the word only? It's one of those words we probably feel like we've always known. We learned it early on. It means only, right? Well, think about what Jesus meant when he used the word only in response to the devil's temptations. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew's account, the third temptation. The devil says, look at all the kingdoms, I'll give them to you if you will bow down or fall down and worship me. So you see posture, fall down, you see worship me. But Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, and here he quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What does only mean? What did God mean when he said that in Deuteronomy 6? Only. This is one of the several times that he's reminding the Israelites about the exclusivity of their service and devotion to him. You go back to Sinai and those Ten Commandments. The first two commandments, Exodus chapter 20, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself the carved image. When he's explaining that second command, he says, you shall not bow down to them. That's a physical action. You shall not serve them. Give them their devotion. So he's saying, don't have them, don't have them around, nor do anything that would give them attention or homage. What does only mean? Only clearly means exclusively. It means we don't have room for anything else besides God. But it also would mean that when we come together for the purpose of worshiping God, He's all our devotion and our attention is focused upon. To connect those dots, 
Again, by way of introduction, think about something Jesus says in the model prayer, Matthew 6. Pray this way. It's a teaching moment. It's a learning moment for us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's so holy that his name is holy. He tells us to pray for the kingdom. Your kingdom come. We know the church has already come. The kingdom is here. Then he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Consider what Jesus is instructing us to pray. Look at the perfect will of heaven. Look at the focus of heaven. And you pray that it will be seen and lived out more and more here on earth. So what's being done in heaven? What will be doing? What will, will, will be happening in heaven? What will we be doing in heaven? As we consider this task of doing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven, we can't discuss that without discussing worship. For worship is continually ongoing before the throne of God in heaven. As we consider our study of healthy church, we spent some time in Titus building some principles about what will help us to be healthy in the sight of God. Not trying to be a perfect church because we're imperfect people. But God shows us when we teach and live out healthy doctrine, we're going to see constantly the grace and instruction of God that will lead us to self-control. And that will always result in good works. Last week we defined good works as something that connects others to God. See, a good work is far more than something that feels good. It actually connects to God. When we think about what worship is, the act of giving, the act of giving praise and honor and devotion to God, we see clearly it fits that category of a good work. Because we are ourselves connecting to God, but we're also connecting to each other as we are in this humble submission mutually before Him. We dive into our thoughts this morning. We want to turn our attention to Revelation just to see some scenes that Jesus gives to John for John to record. It'll show us just the valuable role of seeing worship and joining in worship. That'll help us as we worship here today and each week as his people. So go to Revelation chapter 4. We'll begin in verse number 2. What we're going to notice as we read is that all the attention in heaven is focused upon God himself. So Revelation chapter 4 verse 2, and once I was in the spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne and he who sat there had the appearance, Jasper, Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne was 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, like representing the, the spiritual leaders and thus representative of all of God's spiritual people. Verse number 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, verse 6, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures. Some capacity representing creation, the created beings. And day and night, verse 8, it says, of these, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy. If we say it once, it has meaning. What, about, what happens when we repeat it a second time? And then a third time? These beings repeat the holy nature of God three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're speaking of God's eternal nature in that triad again, just as he spoke of holiness in three terms. Well, now you've got that, that group of living creatures or beasts that don't stop praising God. Well, look at verse 9. That's described. They're going to give him glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And those descriptions of God are repeated for emphasis and to increase the intensity. Well, what happens is almost as if there's this echo between those and the elders that were mentioned before. So verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne. And worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
couple of quick things about this passage. Notice where it starts. We see the picture of the one on the throne, and we see his appearance. And the imagery is that of things that are expensive and beautiful and shine. It's all about his nature. But then you also see, verse 5, what's coming from the throne. It's terms that are kind of related to weather. They're unmissable. They shine bright. They make loud noises. They are intimidating even. What comes from him is unmissable. He's beautiful, and yet he is also all-powerful. So the response is such that all who are there cannot help but focus their attention upon him. So the refrain first is about his holiness, and about his eternal nature. And then the refrain from the spiritual beings, the 24 elders, is all about giving him that honor and praise. But notice their action. Notice what they do. They take the crowns that would have been on their heads and they cast them down before the throne. So these people who have been crowned by God, been given their importance, assigned that importance by God himself, they take what they have and they give it to the presence of God. We want a picture of what's happening when we choose to worship God. That's a great picture. I take any value that I've been given by God and I toss it, I cast it, I throw it down before him. The sacrificial spirit in order to focus my attention upon him and upon his throne. When we know the glory and the power of God, it will lead us to that endless praise and honor that he is so deserving of. I find it fascinating sometimes when you see a, a sink full of water begin to drain. Or maybe a, a tub of water out back or something when you're, you're draining it from below. It falls out of that hole because of the force of gravity. How it is strongest in that single point where the hole is. And the more it keeps funneling, funneling toward that hole, that greater force keeps pulling it down. So the picture is, God's on his throne, and he's so great and majestic and beautiful and holy, we keep funneling our energy and our attention in the form of glory and honor and praise before him and to him. All that we do, anything that we do today, we do because of him and we do for him. We do it because he is so perfect in his attributes we do it because he is so powerful and mighty. And we do it because we know he uses all of those attributes and his power and might for our good. He is love. And so he takes all that he is and he uses it for us. And our response is to give him and return that praise and thanks to him. And so we talk to God. When we assemble together and we focus our attention upon him, we pray, we talk to God, we tell him thank you. We thank him for being the perfect, mighty being that he is. We also bring our concerns before him. We pray for each other. We pray for one another in the room. We pray for those that we know. It's intercessory prayer. We also pray for him to continue supplying all the needs of life. Because he has created all, because he is above all, we keep asking him and talking to him, and we focus in prayer. We also read from his word. We listen to his word. We know that it's the word itself that has the power. It separates soul from spirit. It is the two-edged sword. And so we read and we listen. There's power in the public reading and listening to his word. We also study from his word. We pull out the truths that he gives us. And it's those truths that remind us of things we knew but had forgotten. Or those truths that maybe we had never fully learned. It's those things that give us greater insight into him, into his character, to his will. It's also those things that cause us to be convicted of sin. And to choose to repent and to change. And so when we come together and we study in a time such as we're doing right now, we're doing so because of him and for him. We also sing. Just as those beings did in chapter 4 of Revelation, we take words. And not only do we speak the words, we speak them together collectively at the same time. So we take words that have great deep meaning. We speak them with melodies and harmonies and rhythms all together. 
in order to draw ourselves closer and closer, funneling our energy and attention to his throne. There's something distinctively Christian about singing. It brings us and unites us together, all of us together, at the very throne of God. So this morning, as we walk through the rest of our study, along the way at each of these three main ideas, we're going to pause and sing a song that reflects that idea we've just discussed. So let's sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, Holy. When we think about that beauty of funneling all of our attention to God in worship, it shouldn't take us long to experience that tension of realizing, I shouldn't be able to do this. I'm sinful. I come up short. I do sin, and I have fallen short of His glory. There's a, a quick scene that happens, a quick shift that happens in Revelation where the scene changes a little bit, and, and that's the realization they're having. There's this scroll that represents the work of God, and they realize no one is worthy to open the scroll. And there's weeping, and John is upset. So look what happens in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Verse 7, this lamb goes and takes the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. It's clear who the lamb is. And it's clear what makes him worthy to take the scroll and then open the scroll. The lamb was standing, standing though as though it had been slain. It's Jesus Christ who was slain for our sin, but who did not remain dead. Who is the one who opens to us the will of God and the way to God. He stands, the lamb stands, though slain, because he was raised from the dead by the power of God. He shows us that he alone is worthy to not only reveal the will of man, but to give us access to his glory and majesty. So look at what happens once he does this, verse 9, they sing a new song. What's the response? It's worship. They sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Verse 11, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Not a coincidence, there's seven of those qualities that Jesus is worthy of receiving. Verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne... And to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. 
And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Jesus Christ opens the way for forgiveness and salvation to God. But it's also through that access that we are able to come before Him, to stand before His throne, to kneel before His throne in worship. We're not worthy to approach Him as we do, but we gain that access through a crucified and resurrected Savior. Benjamin Watson is a former college football player and retired NFL player. And this past season was his first season to be an analyst in the studio for the SEC Network. So he's on the SEC Network. He played at Georgia. So he was clearly at the national championship game a couple of months ago, and he was doing his studio pieces. And once the game began, he had an escort that, that represented the media, and that escort carried him to the, the sidelines of the field. But that escort had something to come up, and so he walked away from Watson for a few minutes. And in those few minutes, a security guard came up to Watson and said, can I see your credentials? He showed him his badge and he said, I'm sorry, sir, that doesn't give you access to the field. So he had to leave during the first half and go back to his studio that was there somewhere around the field in the stadium elsewhere. He watched the first half on the TV there. He did his little bit at halftime talking about the game. In the second half, that same media escort from before is now with him again, and he carries him to the sideline a second time, and he stands by them the entire rest of the game. He's able to see his Georgia Bulldogs win the national championship. Watson said nothing changed as far as I was concerned from the first half to the second half. I was the same person wearing the same clothes, had the same badge. But because the one I was with had access, he gave me access. I didn't deserve to be there. My, my badge didn't give me permission to be there, but he did. And so I was there to see and experience what I otherwise could not have experienced. And so too, every time we sing and pray and study, we do so through the power and the sacrifice, the love of Jesus and his resurrection. When we gaze upon the throne room of God... We necessarily look through the hill of Calvary and look through the empty tomb to bring ourselves to that very throne room where the one sits on the throne. It's one of the points that's so emphatic in the book of Hebrews. The argument over the course of the whole book builds in intensity and its climax is in chapter 10. And it's chapter 9 that shows us that Jesus is a high priest in a far better sanctuary. He gives access not to a manifestation of the throne of God, but to the actual throne of God. That's chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, listen to what he says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, see, it's only because of the, of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that our worship finds itself to the throne of God. And it's because of that crucified and risen Savior that he would then continue there in chapter 10 to remind us to come before him in full assurance of faith, to come before him with our confession of hope that doesn't waver, and then to come before him and also stir up one another to love and good works. You hear that? Good works. Worship connects us to God, and all of us who choose to worship together are also stirring up those connections to God with each other. It's God's design to bring us together through His Son to enjoy salvation, but also to enjoy the regular privilege of worshiping Him through His Son. Carry yourselves back in your minds to the garden in Matthew 28. The ladies have gone, and they get the message about why the stone is rolled away. The angel tells them, he's not here, he is risen. Go tell the brethren, go tell the disciples, meet in Galilee like Jesus told you to. There's this detail in Matthew's account, Matthew 28, verse 9. As they're leaving, as they're going to do this, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And the ladies came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Put yourself in the lady's shoes for just a minute. You've just received life-altering news that you're probably still wrestling with. An angel has said, he is not here, he is alive. 
Now you've got this mission to go tell others he's alive. And then that's interrupted by Jesus himself. Would you fall down as they did? What a beautiful scene that would have been. And where does the text say they fell down? They fell down at his feet and they worshipped him. Tell me about those feet. How had those feet looked just a few days before? Now how do they look? What's different about those feet? Feet that were pierced and that bled for our sin, that had been healed, healed to the point to where he could walk out of the tomb. They fall and they worship. Each morning, each Sunday, what a privilege to worship to worship the God of heaven, and to do so through a crucified and risen Savior. That's why in addition to praying and studying and singing, we also come to God's table and worship. We eat, and we think, and we consider that sacrifice. That's why we also give out of what he's blessed us with. Paul sums up the whole process of giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. We give our whole selves. We give financially. We give our energy and worship because he has given all of himself for us. And God raised him from the dead. There's no such thing as Christian worship without the work of Christ. So let's sing together, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how I love Him. He is risen, He is coming, Lord, come quick. Third observation this morning is that worship is always a healthy response, even in trying circumstances. Flip over to Revelation chapter 11. This is a fascinating chapter. There have been trumpets that have been blown, and for the most part, these messages have been very judgmental against those who are against God. There's death, there's judgment happening, but this final trumpet blows. There's a great realization of what's happened. God has conquered and conquered, conquered for the sake of his people. So verse number 15 of chapter 11. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. Twenty-four elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God. Now that they see to the extent that God has conquered, they fall and worship so verse 17, they say, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of earth. They fell on their faces and they worshiped because God had overcome and destroyed he overcame and destroyed those who were trying to keep his people from accessing him. See, these Christians in the seven churches, they were being divided by these sinful influences. And those sinful influences were ramping up their efforts, not just by shaming them, but by financially persecuting them and even physically persecuting them unto death. Half of these Christians, though, were responding with compromise, giving in. They were worshiping the emperor. 
They were giving themselves over to sexual immorality. They were giving themselves over to greed and other financial sins. They were losing their love for God. They needed to be carried back to the throne room of God to see the judgment of God, but also the mercy of God that allows us to worship Him. But the other half of Christians were holding on tight. They were not giving in. They were not compromising. They needed comfort and solace. And so they too needed to go to the throne room of God to see that God conquers and overcomes the ones who are making life miserable for them. Carl Walenda was the patriarch of the Acrobat family, the Walendas. They came over from Europe and they began to be these famous worldwide kind of circus performers. And they were defined by these death-defying stunts up in the air on the high wire, no net, no harness. That's the patriarch there, age 73 in 1978. He's walking a tightrope 120 feet in the air between two hotel towers in Puerto Rico. Winds were blowing that day about 30 to 35 miles an hour. That picture was taken just a few seconds before he would fall even a little bit more in his stance and he would lose his balance and he would fall off the high wire and fall to his death at age 73. In the days that followed, his wife said he was different this time. She said, I don't know what caused it, but he was different. Because all he kept thinking about and talking about was falling. He focused on the threat of falling. He got involved with the the rigs, the safety rigs. In all the years of him doing this, some 60 plus years, he never got involved hands-on with the safety rigs. He left that up to the professionals. But this time, for some reason, it got into his head and he focused on falling and he focused on the rigs. And he fell. See, we may have threats swirling around us. We may have the potential for distractions. But worship is the opportunity and the answer to focus on God despite the threats that would test us. Threats can be big or small in our circumstances. But no matter what, they still pose that threat to distract us. But focused worship is the healthy response, no matter what those circumstances might be. Nothing can stop us. No one can stop us. Do we understand the truth of that, thus that we keep ourselves from stopping us? It's fascinating to think about the context of what we talked about from Hebrews 10. Just a moment quickly, think about that audience. They're tempted to fall back into Judaism. The Hebrews writer wants them to know, if you reject Christ and depart Him, you're leaving the access to God He gives. You can't get to God any longer through the physical holy place. But those who are being persecuted, look at the access you do have. Paul, Silas, Acts chapter 16, nothing can stop them from worshiping. They were literally in the stocks. Could not move, could not go anywhere. And yet they brought themselves before the throne of God in song and in prayer. Because we can always choose to worship. Because Jesus is the one who gives that access. That means that not only can we worship at any time and in any circumstance, it actually is the means by which we are able to make it through the trying circumstances because it realigns our focus and our values upon the one who sits upon the throne. So what we're doing is we're taking what we believe, what we know to be true, and we're not keeping it within. We're bringing it out into the open to give it life more and more. We speak and we show that we trust and we hope and we love God and God alone. We make conscious that which is unconscious. We make public that which we cling to privately. We lift up the one the world would attempt to pull down. And we glorify as majestic the one the world tries to say is common. It's not only possible that we can worship Him at any time and from anywhere. We must so that it pulls us through our most trying of circumstances. Final psalm this morning.
Worship. Focus, worship. It's one of the great many blessings God sets aside for his children in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. So this morning as we consider that privilege of pouring ourselves into worship, if you recognize that's not your privilege because you're outside of Christ, would you choose for today to be that day it changes? Would you choose to come to him? If you're not a Christian, would you choose to confess your belief, your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Would you choose to decide, today's the day I'm repenting of my sin? Living a new life. Would you choose today to the day you're immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Maybe if you've done those things but you know that you've not been living a focused life. You've been living a life that brings shame and reproach upon his name and upon his church. It doesn't have to stay that way. You can choose to repent and come to him this morning as well. This time is for you. We as his church are for you, here for you. Because the Lord is here for you. If you need to come to him. Let us know as we stand and sing.